Hi. Today, I want to talk about Todd McFarlane. Uh, when I was a kid, Todd McFarlane was my favorite artist. I just loved the dynamic of it. He kind of changed comic books at the time, and he just exploded onto the scene with what he was doing. So, I really took to him at the time. Over time, I collected a lot of books just because Todd McFarlane was associated with it. I just became so enamored with him. I, and I went off to college and I remember, you know, I wanted to be a comic book artist. So I was drawing in his style. What I kind of found over the years, and I'm sure Todd admits this himself, is he's not that good of an artist as far as the fundamentals go. Um, just because he understood what was what was great entertaining presentation. And he'll tell you, if you see him in interviews, he always talks about how like he, he would create multiple dimensions with his fingers coming out. Um, there's also this video. I remember this was like the late eighties. Um, I was a kid and, and uh, you had to go to like your local comic book store to get it, but they had like a VHS that Marvel was releasing. And one was, was Stan talking about how to draw the Marvel way. And it had John Buscema in it. And then he did a couple of other specialized videos. One featured Todd McFarlane, where it was, where it was um, uh, Stan Lee interviewing Todd McFarlane. So what I did is I go, well, I try to pick the best of, of what Steve Ditko did, which was that quirky kind of funky style. And then I took what I thought John Romita brought to it, which was the pretty people, the, the great storytelling. I mean, everything was perfect on John's stuff kind of meld the two of them together, mix in like a 90s flair with it and kind of spit it back out on the page. And it seemed to work. I mean, it seemed to work. Um, I remember going out and buying that tape and being like, he's like the rock star of comic book artists. So I was, I was all about him at the time. So um, I, I don't have everything of his, but I have, you know, a lot of the filler stuff. I have all the keys from the 80s, you know, mostly the 90s. I used to have like the the... The Spider-Man Tales, I forgot what those are called. The ones where he did the cover and they'd just be reprints of Spider-Man books. Um, I used to have those. I got rid of them. And then he had a couple others where like he just did the cover. You'd see you know, a, a drawing in the back. I had a lot of those. He inked a lot of the, the New Mutants. Um, and I used to have those. I got rid of those. So um, I'm just going to go through a lot of these quickly uh, just so we can kind of build some excitement about Todd McFarlane. I'm Fox Sellers. And if you like fine art, Movies, character arcs, stories, uh, comic book art, travel, camping, hiking, any of those things, uh, please click like and subscribe and you'll be keyed into future videos just like this one. So um, let's get started on our Todd McFarlane's. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of one-offs here. Um, I have, and I believe he did the interior on this as well, but uh, All-Star Comics number 47. He did a neat little series and he didn't get to finish it. This was this is one of the the best pieces that he early on that he did um which was the the invasion series. I have one, two, I also have three. He didn't do three. I I, I believe something happened and he wasn't able to finish the series, which is too bad, but it was really great. And it's a chance for you to see Todd McFarlane draw all of those DC characters that you you know you'd love to see, like there, there's him doing Aquaman and him doing Firestorm and, and Captain Adam and Wonder Woman and Superman and all that. Like you don't get to see him do a lot of those characters. It was really just Batman was was really the DC character that he did for for so long. Uh, Infinity Inc. is one where he got the chance, and this is still DC, and he banged through the whole series. I mean, he went from uh, he, thirteen. He doesn't do, but he does a pinup in it, and he's introduced in by the DC and like in the back, you know, kind of Stan soapbox kind of thing, but the DC version. He's introduced in there, and then he does the run right after that, and, and starting with fourteen all the way to thirty-seven. So I mean, he did quite a run there. And the early ones, these are some good books. There's, these are just forgotten characters that people don't really remember. Um, that's fourteen, fifteen. Uh, 16 is a key. This is the introduction, the introduction of Mr. Bones. Um, and then 17. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but you know, there's some really great covers in here that he did. Uh, let's see. Here's a good one. Number 28. 
Uh, number 33 is a really great one that he has. Um, and then 36, which has Solomon Grundy on the cover. And this was his last issue. This is just a really great cover as well. So that's his Infinity Inc. series. And lastly, in respect to DC, I'm going to finish it off with some of his iconic ones that he did of Batman. And that is the Year Two series that was in Detective Comics, uh, starting with Detective Comics 576. These are really good ones, by the way. I mean, the, the art that he does in this is just classic Todd McFarlane in it, you know, in his early heyday. And um, I just I love the way he did Batman in these. Uh, 50, uh, 577, 578, and then there's the classic iconic cover. And this one kind of blew up. Um, I got it in pretty good condition. I, I literally bought this, I think, at like Kmart at, at some point. Um, no, no, actually, would have had to have bought it at a comic book store because it doesn't have the, the newsstand on it. Um, so the cover to Batman 423, which is a just iconic. I always, and I've heard him talk where he says that the whole point of this one was he was lazy and he didn't want to have to spend time drawing a lot of it. So he just made the cape ridiculous and all over the place. So it's, it's funny how that turned out really great. Okay. So let me move some of these out of the way. Okay. And next, well, let's move over to Marvel or before I do that, there's Epic, which I think was a subsidiary of Marvel. Um, I don't have the very first one that Todd McFarlane did. It's actually Coyote number 11. And I think it's the first publication he ever did ever. Um, so I have 12 and I have 13 and I have 14. And then there's a couple of one-offs I wanted to show real quick. Um, what the number three, which is where the Spider-Ham character comes from. There's a quick one-off in there. And it's funny, it's actually Batman, but they, I don't know how they got the rights to do it in Marvel Comics, but he did Batman, but he's a guy with a whole set of bats and he just goes around and beats up people. So um, it's just two pages. And then he did the interior, it's a Mike Zek cover for G.I. Joe, but he did the interior for G.I. Joe number 60. And then he did the cover for Conan 241. And then this, he didn't do the cover for, I don't believe, no. But he did the interior, or it's a portion of it, for the Spitfire and the Troubleshooters, number four. And this is one, M Marvel tried to do this. It was an experiment that didn't really work, but they created a new universe. And they had all new characters that they created in it. Nobody really liked any of them, so it, it just didn't pan out. Um, and then he did the cover to Quasar, number 14, which is really great. Um, that's pretty much all I have as far as kind of the one-offs he did. I might be missing some stuff. I'm probably not going to go and find all those, but, um, I do have, you know, a majority of them. And then I have the big stuff. So I have, uh, I have the Hulk run and the Hulk run. I was reading this as a kid. I was buying this off the stands when it was coming out. So that's why I have all these. I think, um, you know, especially the one with Wolverine's a little tough to get. But there, there's some great books, and I love for for the time that he was doing the Hulk, he changed the the look of the Hulk completely. He was going with that. They they had the Gray Hulk at the time because I liked the dynamic of his art so much. I fell in love with that version of the Hulk. Um, it's not the best version, but at the time it was to me. So I have you know this is the first time he showed up in three thirty, three thirty one. 332. A lot of these he didn't do the cover for, but he did the interior for, for all of these. Um, four, 336, 337. This is a cool one because it's got the X Factor in it. Um, there's a couple of X Factor books where I think he did part of the interior, he did the cover or something. And I used to have those, but I, I, I got rid of them at some point for some reason. I think I was trying to sell them and make some money. Um, 338. Yeah, he didn't do the cover to any of these until uh, the big one, 340. And surprisingly, you know, this is like, that's probably a 9.0. Um, 
Um, as much as you would have thought I would have read it as a kid, I probably took care of it. Um, and then 341. Here, let me move some of these out of the way. And 341 he did the cover for. 342. And this was interesting. He had changed the look of the leader. I don't know if I love it. I always liked the look, the look of the original leader, but he kind of brought back the leader. The leader wasn't showing up all that often in, in the comics, so it was really nice to see him. Uh, 343, really great cover. I mean, I love that. 344. And then the iconic 345 cover, which I love. And that's pretty much one of the the quintessential images of the Hulk that was used during that time. Um, just because McFarlane recreated him. Okay, enough of the Hulk. Let's go into Spider-Man. At the time that he switched from the Hulk over to Spider-Man, I was reading the Hulk and buying the Hulk regularly. I was not buying Spider-Man regularly. It wasn't until I saw like maybe three or four issues in and I was like, holy smokes, look at the way he does Spider-Man. And that's when he became a household name in comics. Like everybody was like, holy crap, this is awesome. So, I, you know, it wasn't that hard to go back. I mean, I've even got my LCS sticker on this from when I was a kid. I bought uh, $2.98 for $5. I bought $2.99 for $5. And then I was able to find $300. Um, I don't have a sticker on that one, but I assume I paid less than $10 bucks for it at the time. Um, and all of these are like, you know, nine or up. Um, some of these might be as close as, as far down as eight, but I don't think so. Um, so I've got, I, I've got all of them. So you got 301, 302. This one's still got the sticker on it from when I bought it as a kid. Six dollars for 303, three dollars for 304, 305, 306. Let me shift this a little bit. Three oh seven, three oh eight, three oh nine, three ten. This is a really great cover. I always love this. Three eleven, uh, three twelve, and I, I probably, you know what? I, I had three of these just because I loved the Green Goblin so much. So I, I, I ended up getting rid of the other ones, but I probably used the other ones to read and beat the hell out of that. Um, but this one. This one seems like it's in, you know, still perfect condition. So 312, which was really interesting because I think this is, is this the first time you saw both the Green Goblin and the Hobgoblin together? And, you know, they're kind of fighting. And it's weird because the Green Goblin's on Spider-Man's side because it's really Harry Osborn that, that's helping him out. So, um, and then you got a, a lizard cover. They got the Christmas cover. They got, here's the first time Venom ever shows up on the cover. It's not really a full-fledged character version of it, but. And then you got the first full cover, which is Amazing Spider-Man 316. All right, 317. And this is a great, great little segment, by the way. Those early Venom issues are so interesting because He's a character that's new, but he's one-upped Spider-Man to this point because he figured out, like, not since the Green Goblin has somebody, like, hunted him down and figured out who he was and been one step ahead of him the whole way. So not only is he physically capable of beating Spider-Man, um, physically superior, by the way, but he he's also outsmarted him to this point. And you're like, whoa, this guy's, this guy's for real. Um, 318. And the cool thing was, we touched on a lot of these original characters. You know, you got Scorpion, Lizard, Mysterio, um, Chameleon, Green Goblin, Hobgoblin. All these he touched on. Um, Rhino on this one, 319. 320. 321. 322. Ah, we get to see some Captain America here. Um, and then he does Sabretooth, which is kind of, you know, that's out of left field for Spider-Man. I don't even think he ever met but Sabretooth up to this point. So 324, 325. And this was like, I read the hell out of this, but I had, I think I had a few copies of it. 
I gave one to my son. I, I think I gave him my Peter copy. Um, 328, where he goes up against the Hulk. So I love that. So that's all my Spider. Um, actually, I take that back. That's uh, that's my amazing Spider. And then he did his own series. And this is what kind of, I don't want to say hurt the comic book industry for a while because they were just printing the hell out of the books. They did that with this and they did that with the X-Men number one. And it's just a billion copies of it. But um, I've got the incentive copy that I kept in the bag still. And then I've also got, you know, one that was just off the stand. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven. Ooh, he goes up against Ghost Rider. Eight. Wolverine. Nine. Ten. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. This was always cool. I liked where he went back to the black costume and you get to see him like that. Fourteen. Um, there might be, I don't think there's another McFarlane after that. Um, I think someone else took over, so that's why I had stopped at that point. Um, and then lastly, I don't want to go too deep into like past the 90s because because Todd McFarlane became, you know, a, a pioneer in the industry, whether it be toys or, or uh, just, you know, all things related to comic book characters and then expanded past like he's even included like his, he had a love for uh, baseball. You know, he wanted to be a baseball player. And so he did a lot of baseball toys and, and um, statues and stuff like that. So I'm not going to go into all of that. What I would like to touch on is his early career with, with Image. So him and Jim Lee and Rob Leefield and um, Eric Larson. I'm, I'm missing some other guys probably as well. But they went off and started their own com company. They were all characters they could own. So they had all the rights to it. And, you know, the company itself did not own those characters. So it was a chance for them to really build, you know, a product out there that they, they could, they could have as a staple, like a franchise. So, um, and, and he did that. Surprisingly, he, he really only did spawn. I mean, there's other characters that show up, but he really only sticks with spawn and then kind of branches out on all the different possibilities of spawn. But I think, you know, and I have, I have a beater copy. Um, that I read sometimes, and then I have this one. I probably should get that graded because it doesn't, it doesn't have any ticks. Um, and I've got all the ones that he did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, they, they did this weird thing where they jumped. And I, I think he drew a couple of the ones in between there. But they released the issues out of order for some reason. And I thought it was kind of cool because it was like, wait, what happened to like 17, 18, 19? Or like, and in 20, 21, 22, 23, I think 23 or 24 came out first. And then they went backwards. I, you know, please comment below if you know you know how that progressed but it was very odd how they went out of order um but he was still doing that he, he's he got some covers I, i've got spawns that go beyond that um and they're just i kind of cherry picked the ones that i liked um and kept those and then sold off the rest of them because i was buying it all the way up until i think 100 uh yeah i was in college at the time and i you know i i didn't have a need to keep all of them and it can, takes up a lot of room so i got rid of a lot of them but um, I, I kept the ones. There, there's a couple where he did the cover, but beyond 100, I don't really have anything beyond that. So, um, but that is my Todd McFarlane collection. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in things just like this, please click like and subscribe, and you'll be keyed in on future videos, whether they be comic books, anything related to art, movies, character arcs, stories, uh, camping, hiking, all kinds of fun stuff. You name it. Please click like and subscribe. See you next time.